I'm Dana from Queen's University, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the rotation curve of M31. So before we delve too deep into the details, first let's take a look at why we care about rotation curves, and in particular why we're interested in the rotation curve of M31. The dynamics of stars and gas in the galaxy provide a lot of information about the underlying galactic structure, and in particular, rotation curves can be used to determine the mass profile of a galaxy. Um, and M31 is a prime subject for this type of study, as it is the closest major galaxy to our own. Being only 2.5 million light years away, the spatial resolution of images that we have of M31 is very good. And in addition, lots of previous studies have already collected extensive data on the dynamics of the Andromeda galaxy. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about a summer project that I completed where I developed clean rotation curves for the stellar and the gaseous components of M31. I did this by modeling velocity fields from three different surveys using a newly released program called DiskFit. As you will see, there is a discrepancy between the stellar and gaseous rotation curves for Andromeda and this may be due to asymmetric drift. We can actually use the axisymmetric genes equation to determine the effect of asymmetric drift on a rotation curve. And I will go over that very roughly today and then compare the predicted and the observed stellar rotation curves for Andromeda. Finally, at the end of my talk, I will give you a little bit of an indication about what uh, the next step is in this research. Okay, so for the, um, the velocity fields that we used to derive the rotation curves for our study, uh, we look at planetary nebulae which were imaged in the optical region. We combined two different surveys, the Mare Tatal 2006 survey, which contained about 3,000 objects, and the Sanders Tatal 2012 survey, which contained about 600. Um, we used planetary nebula as tracers of stars because they evolve very rapidly, our stars evolve very rapidly from the red giant phase to the to planetary nebulae. And planetary nebulae are um, preferred for observation as they emit very strongly in the optical region, particularly at the O3 line. Um, to develop our gaseous rotation curve, we used a velocity field from the Shimei 2009 survey, which uh, looked at emission at the 21 centimeter spectral line of neutral hydrogen. Sorry. Um, so, there we go. Um, we modeled the velocity fields that we had using this bit, which you mentioned earlier. And this is a newly released program developed by Christine Speckens and her collaborators at the Royal Military College. And it fits, uh, it fits physically motivated models to velocity fields of disk galaxies. And it has a few advantages over the more commonly used tilted disk method. And in particular, unlike the tilted disk method, you do not need to assume that uh, non-circular motions in the galaxy are small. And disk fit actually fits not only axisymmetric velocities, but also non-axisymmetric velocities of either harmonic order m equals one, which corresponds to lopsided flows, or m equals two, which corresponds to bisymmetric flows, which could be caused by a triaxial halo or a bar in the galaxy. Disk fit has many other features that make it um, advantageous to use for dynamical studies, including that it can fit a warp to the other part of of the disk of a galaxy. And so here I have the model uh, that we made to the optical velocity field using disk fit. The top panel of this graph shows the original field, the middle panel shows our model field, and the bottom panel shows the residual velocities. Uh, as you can see from, from the top field, this uh, the velocity field is quite clean. You can use uh, you can model it with just axisymmetric flows, and that's the model that I've shown here. Um, and you can you can see this because the the receding side, which is the, the yellow and the uh, orange and red side, and the approaching side, which is the purple and blue side of the disk, are roughly symmetric. And you can see that this is a quite a good fit to the data from the residual velocities. We see no large patterns that would indicate that there are m equals 1 or m equals 2 non axisymmetric flows in the velocity field. And you do see a few small features which indicate that the optical disk is quite turbulent. The 
this is a, sim a similar plot for the H1 disk. Um, and you can see here that it doesn't have that same nice symmetry at the center of the velocity field. Instead, uh, you, you see a, like a little bit of a feature there, and the division between the receding and the approaching center of the disk is more angled. And because of that, we could not just use axisymmetric velocities in order to model this disk. We had to include m equals one non-axisymmetric flows. This isn't completely unexpected. Many previous studies have also found that there are significant um, non-axisymmetric velocities in the inner five kiloparsecs of the H1 disk of M31. And again, you can see from the residual velocities that this fit is quite good to our data. So with our clean velocity fields, we could derive the H1 and the optical rotation curves for M31, which I've shown on this plot. You can see that they agree quite well at, uh, in the inner part of the disk, but as you get further out from the disk, the, eight, or sorry, the optical rotation curve, which I've plotted in blue, tends to be lower than the H1 rotation curve. And this indicates that the rotational motions of the planetary nebulae is lagging behind the rotation of the gas, which is an example of asymmetric drift. So asymmetric drift is a phenomenon where stars accumulate random velocities over their lifetime due to collisions and other interactions with stars and other massive bodies. And as a result of, of these collisions, their rotational velocities tend to lag behind the rotational velocities of the gas in the galaxy. And we can actually calculate the effects of asymmetric drift using the genes axisymmetric equation, which I've shown here in a rearranged in a simplified form. As you can see from this equation, in order to calculate the tangential velocity of the planetary nebula in our study, um, we need to know not only the rotational velocity of the galaxy, but also the velocity dispersion and the number of density profiles of the planetary nebula. For the rotational velocity, we used the gaseous rotation curve that I showed earlier. Um, the gas does, isn't affected by collisions the way that stars in a galaxy are, so it's a good indication of the rotation of the galaxy. Um, and then we can calculate the velocity dispersion and the number density profiles directly from our original velocity fields of the planetary nebula, from the planetary nebula. And so here I've shown an example of the tangential um, velocity dispersion profile of the planetary nebula. And this was calculated using only the major axis, or points along the major axis of our velocity field, as we're interested only in the tangential velocity dispersion. And you can see from this plot that it follows a roughly exponential trend. However, rather than going to zero at large radii, it tends to level out at about 50 kilometers per second. And this indicates that the planetary, sorry, the planetary nebula in our survey uh, do experience significant random motions at large, uh, large radii. So with um, the, this tangential velocity dispersion profile uh, and the, um, the, dense, or the number density profile of the planetary nebula, which we similarly calculated from the velocity field, and the um, H1 rotation curve, we can now calculate the expected um, rotation curve for the planetary nebula, taking into account the effects of asymmetric drift, which I've shown on this slide. And so in red, you see the, the calculated um, rotation curve for the planetary nebula. The black shows the observed curve that I plotted earlier. And you can see that they agree quite well, especially at large radii. In the inner radii, you have effects of the bulge, which may cause this a bit of a discrepancy here. Um, and so this does indicate that the, um, that the effects of asymmetric drift do account for the discrepancy between the H1 rotation curve and the uh, optical rotation curve that we derived earlier at large radii. So in summary, um, over the summer in my work, I compared the gases of the H1 and the stellar or optical rotation profiles for M31. We found that there were significant differences between these at radii, especially those greater than about four disk scale lengths. And we did see that asymmetric drift does account for this discrepancy 
uh, between the two rotation curves at Lauren 3 di In the future, we plan to take the queen rotation curves that, we, that I've shown you today and use them to determine the uh, distribution of the dynamical mass in F31. And using this and the uh, distribution of the stellar mass, we can determine the distribution of dark matter in M31 or the Andromeda galaxy. So I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Stefan Corchot, and our um, collaborator, Dr. Christine Speckings from RNC. And I would like to thank you for listening to my talk. Quite well with it.